media. As consumers, we are bombarded by it at every turn, like the Incredible Hulk being bombarded by gamma rays. But what makes some media endure, while others are banished to the forgotten black hole of obscurity, never to be heard from again? Who or what decides this? Hetero life mate Steve and Yehel want to know, and they want to know now. This is Obscurity Now. now, 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 now. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Obscurity Now, the show where we take a look at weird and almost forgotten pieces of media, and then we decide if they should be tossed into the black hole of obscurity or remembered for all of human history. I'm one of the hosts, Steve, and with me is a man who hasn't become gen active despite being in his early 40s. It's... It's uh, Yehel, and uh, yeah, I love being Gen Active, Steve. It's uh, definitely not just some other way to say mutant. Right. Uh, it's oh, its own God. very special, different thing, Steve. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely not some lame-ass metaphor for puberty or something. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it, it is, but... <laughs> oh, I mean, it, isn't it, though? It's like, you know, you hit puberty, and then you get all these wacky powers, right? What? I mean, what, it's not? I, I mean, I don't think I'd call them powers, but... Uh, well, I mean, you know... Desires, maybe? For the, for the Gen 13 kids, that's... Uh, I mean, well, they were clearly in well past puberty by the time yeah, they Yeah, yeah, that, that's uh, why I don't understand the, uh, the metaphor. But, right. but you know what, Steve? Uh, it's okay. You and I were living on opposite ends of the spectrum today. You have been... You have not gone to sleep. It is uh, 8 in the morning your time. <laughs> And me, I have barely woken up. Right, uh, right. I, I think we're pretty much on the same page as far as uh, in the same mindset, actually. Uh, if uh, anyone here is confused about what we're uh, talking about, like uh, we're talking about uh, Gen 13, puberty. the animated movie, and of course, <laughs> puberty. It's, it's a, we'll, we'll get around very to obscure puberty. Yeah, we'll get around to vasectomies at some point, and uh, and don't forget about eugenics. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> Those are our favorite subjects. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh, Dude, God. What is going on? I don't know. All right. So, <clears throat> all right. Pull it together, man. I'm a professional. All right. You, you know what I, You know what the problem is, Steve? What? What's the problem? I think you got a little too much sperm inside you. <laughs> what you need is, is to... Uh, make, uh, perf- why don't you just perhaps some eugenics performed on your sperm? <laughs> We have a vasectomy. Is that? Huh? Huh? Is, this, is this? Is this helping you out? No. And then, uh, you're just making you things to... worse, man. <laughs> well, I don't know, Steve. You're, you you seem very. It seems like your sperm is affecting <laughs> your. <laughs> your life. What the fuck? All right. Okay. All right. So uh... I remember Steve one time cut a promo in wrestling school. Where he went off uh, on Matt Morgan, who at the time was called the DNA of TNA, and Matt Morgan was a wrestler who, for some reason, NASA shot his sperm into space, or his DNA. I'm sorry, not his sperm. <laughs> <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't send his cum into space. But uh, <laughs> Steve said that he was going to keep, and I quote, my DNA right here on planet Earth, where I can raise an army of warriors. <laughs> he was just going to have a lot of sex, <laughs> make an army of warriors to, uh, I then- don't know, fight. Matt Morgan or something. It's a that's a true story, and uh, from what I remember, uh, Bubba liked that promo except for that part where I uh, talked about keeping my uh, my sperm on planet Earth. That was the best part. I, I thought so too. Well, you know, yeah, he, Bubba's uh, an idiot. He doesn't know everything, although he thinks he he does. Um, but yeah. uh, but yes, we're not uh, here to talk about uh, Team 3D or the Dudley Boys. Uh, we're here to talk about. Uh, Gen 13, uh, an animated movie that was never released in the U.S., uh, despite it (laughs) apparently being finished, although I feel like the copy that you and I watched uh, was not finished. Um, What do you think? Um, I mean, it seemed finished to me. Oh, you Uh, didn't see, like, the weird parts where dudes were just sort of hovering in the air, not standing on the ground? I mean, I just assumed that that was just, like, crappy animation. Oh, wow. Well, maybe. All right. Well, uh, (laughs) uh, before we get into it, uh, for those of you who are keeping track of uh, my adventures in comic book uh, creation, I finally have an update uh, for my comic, uh, Escape to Earth. 
I got my proofs back from the printer. I think they look pretty good, huh? What do you think? Hmm, pretty cool. They look excellent. Ah, thank you. Uh, yep, worth every penny. I'm sure I'm going to make all my money back. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I believe you'll be rich. Because uh, the North American comics market is just, it is like, just as good as it was back in the 90s when Gen 13 uh, was coming out. Uh, so, uh, you ready to discuss uh, Gen 13 there, uh, buddy? I am ready, Steve. All right, let's, uh, let's discuss more about your sperm. <laughs> we can talk about Gen 13 in the meantime. <laughs> Welcome to your feature presentation. All right, before we uh, dive into the movie, a little bit of uh, background on the comic, in case you didn't know, Gen 13 is uh, based off of uh, the Image comic book by the same name created by the dynamic duo of Image Comics and Wildstorm Entertainment, Brandon Choi and uh, Jim Lee. Um, before we get to the movie, what are your, uh, what are your memories uh, slash uh, history <laughs> with the, the Gen 13 comic. I am not sure if I ever read the comic or not, to be honest. I feel like I read like an Ash Can or a Zero or something like that might have come with Wizard or something like that. Um, pretty sure I didn't read the comic, though. I do remember seeing it like advertised in Wizard and, and whatnot. Um, I have seen, however, this Gen 13 movie before. Really? Um, oh, wow. This is yeah. my first time. Um, yeah. where, uh... um, I'm a more experienced gentleman. <laughs> Please teach me the ways of the of the gen active. <laughs> uh, but when the funny thing was uh, when when because this movie is available on YouTube and when I like looked it up, it was already like you know how it shows you've already watched the video. It was like said it was already watched, mm -hmm. and and I did remember watching it before. I just wasn't sure if it had been on YouTube. But I'm sorry, you were about to ask a question. Oh, just like how long ago did you watch it? Um, man, I feel like this might have been like. 2015, 2014, mm. something like that. So it, it's definitely been a minute. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, any any particular reason why you watched it? Like maybe you, I don't know what. I don't know. I'm sure you know. I was just looking for some comic book stuff to watch, or mm. like. You were, I, I don't know, Steve. You were cruising uh, for some strange. Yeah, I can barely remember what I did last night, Steve. I didn't realize this was a fucking... Am I applying for the TSA pre-check? What's with all the questions here, Steve? <laughs> wow. Uh, I mean, this is, uh, you know, a podcast where we discuss things and ask questions. But hey, you know, I, I just won't ask any more questions for the rest of the episode. Or I'll just find a different way to phrase them somehow. But well, uh, I, I don't know. I, I feel like maybe I watched it. I, I feel like this was maybe... It was not... I don't think it could have been on YouTube. It must have been like on some kind of streaming service maybe maybe a, maybe some kind of bootleg site you know? right well i remember um i i saw it playing at a con probably mega con back in the day and i was just like oh i didn't know there was a gen 13 uh, movie and then that was the last i saw or heard of it for up until now uh basically yeah. but i remember i did have a copy of gen 13 number one uh only because it was like a real hot book and for whatever reason my um uh, i think my comic shop um like they had just put one back on the shelf so i was like ooh, gimme gimme um because as i was watching this i remembered a lot uh, there was a lot taken from the comic um and put up on the uh, i was gonna say silver screen but i guess this never you know showed up in a movie theater so uh i mm. guess the youtube screen or whatever but uh uh let's see did someone show up in the chat here oh it's you oh, that was me I was, I was <laughs> oh i got excited um so uh so yeah um basically uh then the art of uh gen 13 was done by j scott campbell who's a pretty big deal he also did danger girl you ever read or you know of danger girl no no, no. i i prefer uh safe <laughs> safe. <laughs> but... that's not true in the slightest and you know it uh, so, uh, yeah, the lineup here for um, Gen 13, at least the team roster, uh, according to, I don't know, whatever comic book site I got this from, is uh, Bobby Lane. Who's Bobby Lane? Do you know which one that is? No. I don't okay, know. never mind. All right. Caitlin Fairchild, 
uh, Grunge, he's the the dude, and Roxy Spaulding, uh, they're the ones who just pretty much showed up in issue number one. And then as a side character is uh, Lynch, who's like a regular Wildstorm character. Um, but uh, yeah, um, so moving on to the uh, movie here. It premiered July 17th, 1998, and uh, here's a uh, synopsis. Caitlin Fairchild is a teenager who's offered a place in an institute for gifted children that's definitely not Xavier's Institute for Gu Gifted Youngsters. She soon learns that the school isn't really a school, but rather a military project to turn children with a special genetic structure into super soldiers. After developing incredibly enhanced abilities, Caitlin rebels against the program that created her, but all is not what it appears. There are some in the military who want to help her, and a deadly enemy is actually a long lost sibling. The spoiler alert, where is it? I just gave it. Yeah. Uh, I love how the military is the good guy. Uh, <laughs> right, of course. It's very strange. Yeah, for sure. Uh, this was directed by Kevin Altairi, who directed such uh, awesome cartoons as Alf Tales, uh, Cops, and that's fighting crime in the future time, Cops. You know, not. The oh, real. now we know why the, why the cops are so well regarded in this. For sure. Uh, Batman, the, the, the animated series. And uh, he worked on Mask of the Phantasm. <laughs> but it, the awesomeness doesn't stop there for Mr. Altieri. He also worked on, remember this one, Stripperella. <laughs> remember that? Yep, sure do. <laughs> you we know we're going to we're gonna have, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And yeah. He's, uh, he's still working, apparently. Um, and uh, this was uh, written, at least the screenplay, was by Kevin Altieri. And the only other writing he did was on Batman the Animated Series, which, I mean, if you were going to write a cartoon, that would be the one to do it. And this was also written by uh, Karen Colas, and all she wrote was this. And, but she apparently was also additional crew for Batman the Animated Series, so one could deduce that Kevin and Karen hooked up <laughs> Kevin brought her on for this project to try wow, out. Maybe it's her. it couldn't just have been her talent, huh? Nope, nope, nope. They definitely hooked up. Uh, at least that's oh, the, that's the narrative I'm creating here. Um, yes, and uh, this was uh, produced by uh, Aegis Entertainment, Epoch in 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 Inc. Incorporated, and Wildstorm Productions. And uh, do you know the story of uh, why this sort of how this film came to be, why it was never released in the U.S.? Um, yes, I did see that basically Disney had like bought the rights to it or something. Mm -hmm. um, but the film was already in production and basically they didn't want to um, like be associated with like a movie produced by Paramount, I guess. Well, what I have uh, here off of Wikipedia, because uh, yeah, I did see that um, it was, I guess, distributed by Paramount. Is that okay? So, um, yeah, uh, Disney wanted to put out a Gen 13 movie, so they started production. And then um, Jim Lee decided he wanted to sell out to DC Comics. Uh, so basically, he did that. And uh, even though the movie was finished, uh, Disney was like, Oh, hey, uh, you guys are kind of competitors, um, so we're just going to shelve it, uh, at least here in the yeah. U.S., even though it was officially released in Europe, Australia, <laughs> and even Russia. <laughs> yeah, and, and to be more specific, uh, Disney, DC was owned by uh, Time Warner, yes. which obviously Time Warner is a competitor to Disney, and that's why they didn't... Uh want to release basically they don't want to be associated with releasing an ip that's owned by a competitor precisely thank you because it's you. like free promotion for time Warner. Basically. exactly exactly it's just like if uh <laughs> i was gonna make a wrestling analogy but you know what instead why don't you just go ahead and take us through the cast sounds delightful steven mm -hmm. um we'll start off first with alicia witt who is the voice of caitlin which is kind of like the main character mm -hmm. uh not kind of she is the main character yep, it's her story um i think most people probably know her these days from uh orange is the new black she plays zelda on there uh she was also in the exorcist tv series that nobody watched um next we have elizabeth uh daly who plays freefall 
Uh, Elizabeth uh, has done a bunch of uh, voice or well, she's she, yeah she's done did a bunch of voiceover work. She was in Rugrats, uh, the the reboot, not the OG. Hmm. Um, or maybe she was in the, I don't know. But I did think it's funny she had this show, uh, and I'm assuming this is like a, some kind of parody comedy, but it's called Melania Trump's Cousins: How to Be a Model and Marry a Billionaire. It's a TV series with 11 episodes. Wow, that sounds interesting. <laughs> I know. I, I was I was like, should we cover this? I, I would. Might as well throw it on the list. Why not? It's from 2016. I mean, it definitely seems to be some kind of, I don't know, comedy. I, right. I don't know. There's only like three people in the cast, so it's probably off it. Yeah. Um. Anyways, next we have for some inexplicable reason, Flea. Mm-hmm. Flea of Red Hot Chili Peppers fame is the voice of grunge mm-hmm. and... Uh, yeah, I mean, Flea does have quite a few credits to his name in IMDb, and I, I do know that he's popped up in... I've seen him pop up in, like, usually cameos, I feel like, in random movies and stuff. Yep. But, uh, yeah, he he's a bass player, and he's <laughs> one kind of, the best. of an actor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyways, um, moving on, we have somebody that you may have heard of, Mark Hamill. Who? <laughs> who yeah, this is Mark. Mark, Mark, Mark. Hamil, Hamil. Uh, <laughs> anyways, he plays the voice of uh, Threshold. I think most people, of course, know him uh, better as uh, General Stahl and Be Cool Scooby Doo. That's where everybody knows. <laughs> yes. Camel from, I believe. Right. Um, then we've got uh, too many people on this, but we're, we're getting down to the to the nitty gritty. Lauren mm-hmm. Lane, who plays Ivana Bull. Uh, Lauren Lane, uh, I recognize her from The Nanny. She was uh, C.C. Babcock in The Nanny. Uh, hmm. Pretty fun little show, I feel like. From, I never uh, knew you movies. watched that. I only saw like a few episodes, but yeah. Yeah, it's not bad. Nah. It's not bad. There's some people that are from Star Trek in it. <laughs> uh, so... <laughs> then we have Cloris Leachman, who plays uh, oh shoot, uh, Helga Kleiman. You know Cloris Leachman from No Longer Being Alive. <laughs> uh, she has passed away. <laughs> <laughs> she has left us uh, mm-hmm. but yeah she had a pretty good career uh, until it ended with her death uh, <laughs> <laughs> the funniest thing to me though is looking at her IMDB and uh, she had like stuff come out last year but she's got one thing uh, called Everbrook and it just says it's announced no releases so she's Whoa, got some wow. so she's still getting out. work alright good for yeah, her yeah. Uh, and the last person I want to go over, uh, oh, actually, John Demita. Uh, I almost forgot about him. He plays Stephen Callahan. Uh, he's been in a bunch of stuff, but you don't know him from anything. He's in a lot of voiceover work. Uh, well, he, I think he like did something in Naruto, so people probably know his voice. Mm-hmm. Um, and then finally, of course, we have John Delancey, uh, who plays the voice of uh, Colonel John. <laughs> you know, it's so fucking weird. So the character's name is John Lynch, Colonel John Lynch. And his uh, nickname is Jack. Right, right. Like, what a terrible nickname. Like, your, your nickname is just another... Another name. Ver- another name, another regular name that's the exact same syllable well, you know, as your already short name. But, like, that's a, that's a thing because some people, I, I don't know if it was in movies or, or something, they refer to, like, John F. Kennedy as Jack Kennedy. It's like... What is your name, John or Jack? Like you've never. Yeah, yeah it's weird. Yeah, it's it, it's 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 weird. That one doesn't make any sense. Nope. to me. Like nope. Like I like Jim is usually a nickname for James, which mm-hmm. again seems like it's a little, but at least it's less letters, so I can right. understand that better. But, anyways, uh, John Delancey has been in a bunch of stuff. Uh, but of course, Steve, oh, you know him, I know him. The world knows him as Q from Star Trek: The Next Generation and Star Trek: Picard. Is that all we have for Star Trek? That's all. That, that, that's here it comes, be, baby. All. Here it comes. <laughs> ah! Oh no! We've just entered another Star Trek connection. Ah! All right. Happy to see it. <laughs> you, you know, like John Delancey, though. Like his kind of like I think a lot of like people. If you're not a Star Trek fan, and if you know who John Delancey is, mm-hmm. you know him because he plays like some character on My Little Pony, basically. <laughs> oh, I just know him uh, from Legend. <laughs> oh yeah, with, that with that. Richard Dean Anderson. I can't remember yeah. what character he played, but uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, well, but all big right. Cast. Big yeah. cast for a uh, for a big mediocre pile of uh something um but uh yeah so you ready to dive into this thing yeah let's do it 
All right, so some uh, text floats up on a computer terminal and tells us, Gen 12 test subject Stephen Callahan has gone rogue and must be retrieved dead or alive, and he's manifested the Gen factor. Now, mm. Mm, yes, already we're into it. Uh, so uh, exterior, wooded highway, night. A station wagon speeds down an empty road. Suddenly, a light from above shines on the station wagon and fires lasers at it, causing it to crash. The car catches fire, but not before the inhabitants of the car. A dad, a mom, a baby, and a young boy escape just as it explodes. And then the mom is violently gunned down by the helicopter. Uh, then yeah. uh, the dad uh, sort of freaks out. Tetsuo from Akira style and destroys the helicopter with his psychic powers. Um, he then hands off the baby to the young boy. Uh, and then he himself is gunned down by a different helicopter as his son looks on. Uh, so, you know, typical Disney stuff right off, <laughs> right at the opening right. here. Um, and, uh, and then we, uh, um, yeah, that, that's basically the end uh, Roll opening credits. Um, and now we are uh, inside a room, day. Uh, Caitlin Fairchild awakens in her bed, uh, screaming and disturbing her roommate because she's uh, dreaming, basically, the opening sequence that we just saw. And uh, Alexa, who is not the one that everyone knows from Amazon, but is indeed her, uh, her roommate, uh, tells her that she needs to see a shrink. And then Fairchild realizes she late. she's late because her alarm didn't go off because Alexa is such a bitch. She turned off the alarm. So uh, any comments on what we've seen so far? Like, what did you what did you think of the opening? I mean, it's a decent little opening. It, it does set the scene right off the bat that this is going to be a more adult mm -hmm. uh, film, you know. Um, it, it's fine. Uh, I'm glad that they kept the background scene pretty short. Um, yeah, I thought it was pretty decent. What, what, what say you? I thought, uh, yeah, it's definitely uh, intriguing. You, you want to know what's going on. Uh, what do you think of the animation, like, from the beginning? Um, man, I feel like the animation throughout the whole thing is very uneven. Yeah. Uh, sometimes it's uh, pretty good to decent, and then other times it's just like, like we were talking off air. Uh, that's right, everybody. We have conversations inside <laughs> And, uh, yeah, some, you know, you mentioned that it seemed incomplete mm -hmm. in uh, art. So, yeah, man, just very uneven, uh, inconsistent animation. Right. I mean, I'm sure this is uh, this was made before, you know, everyone started animating uh, digitally. Um, but, uh, you know, you'd think that since, you know, Jim Lee was the freaking executive producer here, he could have, like, you know, cracked the whip on whoever was, like, animating this and being, like, you know especially since he's such a stickler with his own work like but uh yeah. i don't know maybe they just didn't have uh the budget or i mean i just yeah as you said i just thought the whole thing was complete incomplete as i was watching it but then later when i was like uh, doing research and it said that it was complete and actually released in different countries i'm like wow they just <laughs> were really just kind of yeah. lazy at times yeah, and the version we watched, I mean, it's the, you know, Paramount distributed version, you right. know, so it's it's the legit version. I will say I do like how it opens, um, like, a movie as far as, like, the opening credits. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's very, I, I, like, well, I mean, for when this was released, which I think was, like, 2000 or something like that. Right. It's uh, very cinematic. Yeah, uh, sure, sure. For, for an animated film of that era. So. Absolutely. So, uh now, our exterior school day, a uniformed government guy is, like, hanging out on the steps of school, and he meets uh, Fairchild as she uh, steps up and tries to go to class. He tries to recruit her uh, with a full scholarship to join this uh, sort of uh, government-type thing. It, uh, it's so, and it makes no sense, because he's like, I'm going to give you a scholarship to this school that you can only get into, and you can't even apply to it. Uh, we only recruit people into it, and it's government funded anyway, or whatever. Like it made no sense. No, like, no, it doesn't. But I guess it's supposed to be. I guess it's supposed to be him trying to sell her on it or whatever. Um, right. It's interesting that they didn't go the usual. We're just going to kidnap you and make you right. join us kind of route. So yeah, uh, I guess. Well, then you cool. wouldn't have the the mis like because you know once she gets there, 
she thinks it's a legit school. So you wouldn't have that sort right. of, yeah, mystery the whole time. Um, yeah. And this was released. Uh, so the film was released in um, 2000. However, it, was, it looks like it was finished in 1998. So animation probably started um, work on it probably like 96 or something. Yeah. Like that. Oh, it feels very 90s and not in a right. good way. Um, yeah. And by the way, we do have uh, Stadium Mart, a.k.a. Stry is here. It says, hey, guys. Uh, Glad I didn't miss this one. Uh, thanks for joining. Stry, Steve is, uh, I, you might have missed, no. he has not gone to sleep. Uh, it is uh, 8.30 a.m. his time, and I barely got any sleep. It is 11.30 my time. Yep, so it's a pretty wacky episode. Uh, I hope you can handle it all. Uh, but uh... Yeah, By the way, I, I am shocked that Disney even wanted to make a Gen 13 movie. Like, Gen 13, from what I remember, was not... A particularly super popular comic no no it was uh, when it first came out like it was a i remember it was a big deal i remember they uh for, for issue 13 they had 13 different variant covers okay right but i mean i feel like all image comics back then the first year or so right they was, started out I mean, as a big deal well. and then they would peter out um so yeah, I don't. I mean, I was thinking the same thing. Like, why not the Wildcats or Cyber Force? Well, the Wildcats already had their cartoon. They had, at a, that they point. had a cartoon. So why not Cyber Force or? Uh... But see, this was released. So the comic book though came out in 1994, like mm -hmm. February of 1994. Right. So by by the time they started working on this movie, like it couldn't have been that popular. I I don't know. We we didn't do any proper research like getting sales figures or anything Shh. like that. So. <laughs> don't, don't tell them that. <laughs> Good God, man. All right, so uh, so we're in a classroom here. Fairchild, uh, she starts reading the brochure, and she starts sort of zoning out uh, and doesn't realize that her professor is calling on her. And uh, then, you know, you think you're going to get that uh, sort of classic thing where the professor is like, Ooh, why aren't you paying attention, Miss uh, Fairchild? Like, is uh, he actually says, like, oh, is the... Uh, something such and such boring you and then we fairchild goes well actually you forgot to mention this 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 and basically they're sh trying to show us that fairchild is incredibly smart even smarter yeah. than her own professor uh yeah. so now we're back into fairchild's dorm uh she try she tries to return to her room but it's locked because her roommate is in there boning some dude she answers the door naked and uh, tells uh, Fairchild she needs 15 minutes. Fairchild looks at the brochure and then at a payphone, and now we're off to the races. Uh, exterior day, Fairchild uh, flies in a shield in a shield style helicopter, <laughs> which lands on a shield style military base. <laughs> uh, she exits the helicopter and meets uh, Helga some weird looking lady in a schoolgirl uniform and she's got a like a german accent yeah i was just gonna say is that what, what you think it's supposed to be german i think so yeah that's uh the, the accent was a little inconsistent yeah well since you mentioned it what do you think of like the voiceover performances like overall for this movie i mean they're okay in some scenes but overall not very good Mark Hamill sounds bored. To he, oh, yeah. It's like his worst performance ever. Uh, it's yeah. like, come on, man. Just do the Joker voice. That's all anyone wants to hear. <laughs> but to be fair, I mean, I, I, and he's not really given particularly great material here for his character. I, I, have, However, a, I have a theory. I, I feel like this is almost like a scratch track. Like, uh, I mean, again, this goes oh. back to the... <laughs> Or am I Sorry. boring you, Mr. Yehel Velasquez? <laughs> Sorry, my uh, my alarm went off. Uh, I would normally be up at this time. Yes, you know, uh, my but... my alarm is going off. It's saying find a new co-host. Uh, anyway, <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, I I feel like the whole like uh, all the dialogue and or most of the voiceover work is just like a like a first or second take, and they never got to go back and like make it better. Uh, and if you had to pick like who the worst voice is out of all of them, who would you pick? Come on, come on. <sighs> Grunge. Yes. Thank you. Thank Grunge. you. Thank you. And that hurts me because I am a student of Flea. I tried to play many of his bass lines. I would say probably successfully most of the time. 
and he should stick to playing bass and never enter the world of voice acting again after this performance. Yeah, I mean, if he's going to continue being in the Red Hot Chili Peppers, he can stop playing bass. <laughs> right. Well, remember that Super Bowl where they played, and then it was revealed that his bass wasn't even plugged in? You remember that? Yeah, but to be but to be fair, I mean, that's pretty typical. Because Im- imagine playing in a loud stadium like that. Like, you're not going to be able to, like get like proper feedback from your monitors i feel like you know because of the big open space um and i don't know i mean <laughs> by the way i saw red hot chili peppers live once and one of the worst performances i've ever seen really uh, b- but also one of the worst definitely the worst vocal performance i've ever seen oh yeah anthony kiedis was always trash always yeah that, that guy cannot hold a fucking note to save his life he wouldn't even be able to hold a note if you offered him a bag of heroin or something like that. <laughs> take that anthony kiedis and your yeah, millions of dollars you check your millions of the house yeah <laughs> yeah yeah it's funny he uh for some reason he's in point break briefly but uh for some oh. reason uh anyway uh okay so uh so yeah they she goes and meets helga and like I guess, all right, we'll get to that in a minute. But uh, so as she's walking through the base, like taking it all in, she goes to walk up, or Fairchild and Helga go to walk up some stairs. Grunge bursts through a door, falls down the stairs on the Fairchild, and Helga stabs him in the butt with a syringe. I guess they say he doesn't want to take his like weird little meds or whatever. Then out of nowhere, uh, Roxy slash Freefall, which I don't do they even use her code name in this movie at all? Like I wouldn't even know that she was think so. called that if you wouldn't have told me at the beginning or the IMDb didn't tell me. No, but, I don't I don't think that I don't think that they use it. Not that I can remember. Yeah, so Roxy shows up, Helga yells at her for smoking, and there's some other sort of like forced, like terrible comedy from I think from Grunge. And yeah, like Yeah. Man, the com the jokes or the comedy in this is so bad so awful yeah um yeah and uh i don't know maybe i think and sadly i think it comes right out of the comic like (laughs) but uh anyway so now we're in a dojo and uh then a guy with a weird eye who is matthew who spoiler alert is later revealed to be um threshold trains with a big scary looking karate guy um so uh, Matthew um, gets punched in the face, and then he gets mad and uses his psychic powers to break the karate guy's foot. Then he gets a video call from uh, a, a woman who's later revealed to be Ivana, who's basically the main uh, villain slash uh, mm-hmm. antagonist of the show, and uh, basically tells him to keep an eye on Fairchild because she's the progeny uh, of someone from the Gen 12 and Team 7 program. Uh, and this is all part of, like, Wildstorm, like, backstory uh, lore. I think Grifter was on Team 7 with with Deathblow, the guy who blew too hard. You remember Deathblow? I don't remember Deathblow. <laughs> he blew like, too he, hard. His name is literally his power. Like, he blows really nah, so hard he'll kill you. Actually, he's just like a, I don't know, just some, he's basically the just, punisher. He sells tainted coke. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that would have been so much better if they would have gone that route. Uh, you should have worked for Wildstorm in the 90s. Maybe they wouldn't have sold sure. out to uh, DC. And then, after that, we get a... Uh, uh, I mean, any comments on any of that, basically? No, I think you summed it up uh, pretty well. Um, I wish I would have uh, just listened to your summary rather than watch it. Uh, <laughs> for the second time in my life. But uh... Oh, I can see uh, where this episode is going. So then we get... I swear, what felt like the world's longest training montage of uh, basically Grunge, Roxy, and Fairchild, um, you know, training and going through class, like fighting, doing push-ups, like your basic sort of Rocky-style um, training montage to some really bizarre-sounding music. Do you remember? Like, it starts out with... Yeah. Yeah. Like, I thought the it was... The music was super weird. I, I thought it was like Primus or something for a second there, um, or something. It, it was almost like they like they told Flea, "Hey, can you play, write something for us?" And he's like, "Sure." But then he fell down the stairs when they were recording, and they said, "All right, <laughs> thanks, Flea. We'll use it." Right, along with like your first take uh, and lame voiceover. Um... You know, I, I'll say this for Flea's uh, 
voiceover. At least he tries. Sure. You know. Sure, sure. He, uh, and he try. like tries to put some personality in it. Like I don't know if his, I don't know if the problem with his voiceover is the material or him. Um, he does do kind of a generic surfer, dumb surfer right. guy kind of voice thing, but I suspect that was the direction. Oh, I'm I'm right there with you. I mean, these characters are so. Like there's no depth, like in the slightest. They are one yeah. note. I mean, who who is grunge? Oh, he's a dumb party dude. Who's Roxy? Well, she likes to smoke, and Fairchild is smart. Like that's yeah. basically it. Yeah. That's all. One we... note is a great way to describe it. The Anthony Kiedis vocals of characters. <laughs> You're on fire today, Mister No Sleep. Uh, so then the montage finally ends and uh, uh fairchild and um uh rainmaker uh they don't say her name till later but uh, i think she As okada is here <laughs> okada uh you mean okado you know what i'm talking about um it's okada from uh, new japan pro wrestling his nickname's the rainmaker anyway oh that's just, right just oh shoot yeah okay you uh yeah, i know you're too busy worried about keeping your dna on on planet <laughs> earth to like fight matt morgan to uh oh he's only like one of the best wrestlers in the world that's all uh, but i yeah. just well, haven't steve, steve you're one of the best podcasters on this channel <laughs> Thanks. That's the nicest thing you've ever said to me. I'm going to take that compliment and move on. So, uh, yeah, Fairchild and Rainmaker, uh, you know, she's obviously Native American. So, of course, she has to be Rainmaker. They fence right. American Gladiator style with those, uh, you know, sort of bow staffs while the rest of the team uh, looks on. And, of course, Fairchild eventually wins. And then... <laughs> And then we get what could only be described as like a complete like fan service scene uh, where Fairchild showers and then Roxy joins and then they just have like a conversation about Matthew. Uh, Fairchild says that he she thinks he's uh, creepy and uh, there's so much like have you ever watched like a um, like an anime that's obviously like censored for the U.S.? Yeah, that's what this felt like. It felt like, yeah. a, you know, they wanted to like, you know, be like really adult here. But then someone later, like after they did the scene, you know, possibly, I don't know, Disney or whoever was like, and this is a little too adult. So they had to superimpose like fake steam, like all over this, like to the point where you where it just really doesn't make any sense. You feel like you're in some sort yeah. of like void. But the weird thing is, too, like later on when Fairchild's Gen 13 powers activate or whatever, mm. like she kind of rips through her clothes Hulk style because she gets taller and wider. Right. And like her shirt rips off and they show her bare breasts for, for a second. However, did you notice there's no nipples? Oh, yes, I noticed. <laughs> that reminds me. Remember in Orlando how there's like a no nipple um, like uh, law because of Disney? And when yeah. um, and when the uh, WrestleMania, when they had their posters there, they had to airbrush all the nipples off the um, off the yeah. wrestlers. Like, they <laughs> Disney hates nipples, man. They just hate yeah. them. Yeah. Well, you know, those are just working nipples, anyways, brother. <laughs> <laughs> this is the weirdest episode ever. Uh, so uh, Fairchild is then studying in her bed when a puff of smoke just uh, comes out of like a vent and knocks her out. Then some of like the guards uh, slash stormtrooper looking dudes uh, come and they take her away. Uh, and then uh, they also take Roxy and Grunge to a lab where Matthew and Ivana look on. What? <laughs> Why does Ivana always wear like a ballroom gown? Did you ever ask yourself that question? I no, I didn't. But um, yeah, it's very strange. Yeah, it's, sure. it just doesn't make any sense. It just it just goes back to show you they were it's like all about style over anything making any sense back at Image in the nineties. Yeah. Um, so like, all right, all of the the gang, the Gen Thirteen gang, are all in these tubes. Then the tubes start to fill with water. Uh, then they are told, and okay, so then, um, so Ivana and Matthew are looking on as they're trying to, I guess, conduct this experiment. They get a call, um, and Ivana starts to freak out because she hears that a lynch is arriving. And um, I have to say, um, much like with Mark Hamill's board performance, 
I also found Lynch's voice to be lacking uh, from yeah. a cue there. And, uh, you know, it, uh, like Lynch is like, so going through like up until this point, I was like, oh, you know, these characters suck. But then I remember like Lynch from other comics. I'm like, oh, well, at least he's going to be cool. But the vocal performance is just so sort of blah that he just, yeah. just kind of sucks the life out of the out of the scene. Um, but uh, anyway, he he shows up and tells Ivana um, as they ride in the elevator that she doesn't fully comprehend the power of the gin factor and they shouldn't be experimenting on people. And uh, then we cut to uh, that night in the woods from the beginning, and it's obviously a dream sequence. We see the little blonde boy and his sister continue to run from uh, the bad guys who gun down their parents. Uh, they fall down a waterfall, and he loses his sister down a drain, and the bad guys come and basically take uh, the, the little blonde boy. And then Fairchild wakes up. Now we are in. Uh, any uh, any thoughts on that scene there, uh, Dr. Velasquez? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, by this point, I was already checking out. <laughs> Oh, no, at um, least you're honest. And uh, mm. I was like, oh, oh, no, I have seen this, I believe was my thought. Uh, mm. And it's never good when you tell yourself, oh, no, I have seen this. <laughs> well, so. I'm sorry you had to sit through it again. Uh, but uh, so, yeah, now we're in a cafeteria. Um, Matthew goes and tries to talk to Lynch. And uh, once again, Lynch says he should be against the Gen 13 program. Uh, Fairchild then uh, then we cut to Fairchild she get, gets her food and she looks at it and sees bugs in it she hallucinates that there's bugs in it uh, Lynch then comes and helps her and tells Fairchild that he served with her father then brunette lady says Lynch is a threat to the entire program um, so uh, now we're back once again with Fairchild studying in her bunk uh, she gets headaches, throws up for what it seemed like a long, long time again. Mm -hmm. She tries to call for help. Like there's like a, you know, panel by the door and nobody comes. Uh, but she's able to, to get out of her bunk and stumbles around the base. And she, uh, uh, it, she accidentally crumples some metal along the way. So the idea here, in case you're not uh, getting it, is that her, her powers are slowly like kicking in. Then we, uh, she finds a computer terminal with her dad's file on it, uh, and she finds out that her dad had powers yeah, too. Very convenient. Yes. Very convenient that the computer terminal is on, it's active, no password needed, well, and it happens to have pulled up information about her dad. This is a classic Brandon Choi. So, uh, if you didn't but then again, I, I, I guess it was part of. Um, now that I remember, right? Uh, Threshold's plan mm -hmm. to like get her powers activated. So he's trying to rile her up basically because exactly. that's apparently how your powers become activated if you just have a, a bad day when you get angry sure sure so uh, grunge and roxy show up one of the guards uh find them uh, and tells them it's a restricted area he punches fairchild and then oh man i didn't haven't even commented on how terrible the dialogue is in this um and again yeah. I, I feel like a lot of it is is taken from the comic and they didn't bother to punch it up at all um roxy says you creep you stormtrooper creep and that's just one of a few star wars references that come up later and then because of getting punched fairchild then uh, hulks up as yahel says that she does and punches the guard then she bursts out of her shirts but has no nipples because disney hates nipples more guards then show up and try to capture Fairchild, but she overpowers everyone. And uh, I don't know if I like, you know, sort of put this together at this point, but um, you'll see through as the movie moves forward that basically Fairchild doesn't need the other members of Gen 13. She's no, the they, smartest they are... and strongest. And like, yeah, it's like, why were they're more... definitely slowing her down mm -hmm. uh you know yeah 100 percent uh so i mean why would you have a team if it's not even well balanced but blah 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 whatever now to be fair it's because the other two just don't have their powers activated yet Yeah, but even when they do. do like i mean when she could have well we'll get to that part 
So Matthew yeah. walks in um, and tells uh, to basically we're back in sort of like the control room uh, with Ivana and her like uh, computer goons. Matthew walks in and tells Ivana that Fairchild has become gen active. Uh, Rainmaker, not the wrestler, is trapped in her room uh, and then uh, rendered unconscious. I don't know why they felt a need to show us that. Um, uh, but uh, Ivana then tells her computer goon that she wants Fairchild captured at once. Uh, the for they show the forces then mobilizing. They start searching for Fairchild and the rest. Um, as the gun goons or, or guards, whatever you want to call them, are searching, uh, up above in like a sort of air duct, um, Fairchild is basically holding her hands like against the wall and behind her is Grunge and Roxy. Uh, and here's some more hilarious uh, humor coming your way, you hell. Um, oh, yeah. Grunge says he needs to fart and, uh, you know, Roxy says that he just needs to hold it. Um, and then Fairchild says, oh, yeah. But then, of course, so the guards leave and then Grunge farts. Ha, 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 how hilarious. And they fall down. Yeah. So Roxy then asks Fairchild how she's doing. She says she's feel great, like she's getting stronger and stronger uh, every time or at every minute. But she feels bad that she killed the guards. But uh, Roxy tells her that they had it coming for some, I don't know, just. Oh, oh, she says she had no choice. Right, right. There you go. And uh, there's some really bad voice acting here, I think, from uh, Fairchild. Um for maybe because she, oh yeah cause she like i can't remember why i just put down terrible voice acting overall there there you go yeah yeah so then then fairchild gets her sort of classic outfit um of course it's not classic to you if you've never read the comic or are unfamiliar but it's like that green sort of bathing suit thing that has sleeves but no pants for some reason which really doesn't make any sense to me but uh hey right. Who are we to, to question the great Jim Lee and J. Scott Campbell? Um, so uh, guards find grunge and the crew and throw a grenade. It uh, basically knocks out uh, grunge and Roxy. And uh, somehow the explosion knocks Fairchild like through an elevator shaft, which leads outside. <sighs> Fairchild... <laughs> <laughs> this is taking forever uh fairchild then runs um and then some airborne hovercraft thing kind of fire on her um and uh but she easily basically takes one of them down because she's just too powerful uh a guy and a me- some dudes in metal s- suits show up shoot missiles at her she defeats it then Helga in a robot suit comes after her, but Fairchild very easily and very anticlimactic knocks her down a hill. And for right. some reason, there's like a some sort of scene with uh, Helga that says, uh, oh, you were my favorite Liebchen, which like, yeah. why is that? I mean, why? it's a little late in the game to try to have some sort of... Uh, you know, weird relationship with them. Like, I guess they were right. trying to add some sort of emotional something to that fight, but it was pointless. Ultimately, pointless. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. So now, uh, Roxy and Grunge are uh, being held by uh, Ivana and Matthew, and they're basically being tortured uh, for information. Uh, Ivana gets another call and leaves. I'm starting to see a pattern here for all these scenes. It's like she's yeah. always getting calls and leaving. Um, so uh, Matthew then tells um, Grunge and Roxy that uh, he he's going to keep torturing them until they become Jan active. Uh, right. Now we're back. And also, and also, Steve, because he likes doing it. Yeah. He's a bad guy. He's, well, yeah, I guess. Um, so now, it, it was just so weird because, I mean, like, I don't know. Why does he want them to become gen active exactly? Yeah, I, I don't really know either. Um, like, why would you want three people that don't like you to get superpowers? Well, like, it's so weird. Yeah, why and, and does, I guess that they want to use them. Well, right? yeah, but, that's yeah. So I guess, you know, he's working with Ivana. Right. And I guess the idea is to make them have powers so she can use them for 
her bidding evil I, yeah for evil but, i guess but like wouldn't you want to before you um get them to become gen active like you know get them onto your side yeah, in terms and of them with whatever you yeah brainwash yeah. them something before you give them you know you know godlike powers that could easily destroy you but no eh, you know they, these people they're not planners you know <laughs> no yeah hell it's more important to you know have like almost nudity and shower scenes like you know they could have used that time to like develop you know an actual you know plot that made sense but no 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 fan service was more important and now we just get to see them get their powers and then whatever happens happens yeah. uh so <laughs> Moving on. Uh, okay, so Fairchild tries to sneak back into the base. Oh, God, this was... Oh, it's like, this is the kind of, like, sort of superhero storytelling that I just, like, I hate when it's... Like, it, this should be, like, really serious, this, like, part here where she needs right. to, like, get back in there and, like, get her... This is the kind of stuff you see in a lot of, like... I feel like you see in a lot of newer Marvel movies... So she needs to get in and, like, help her friends and, like, get them because, you know, conceivably they could be being murdered at the moment. So she puts on the robot suit and then does, like, a bad impression of Helga to try to fool the guards. Um, but uh, but then they're not. And, I, and I'm surprised that they didn't have the guards be fooled. Right. Like, they immediately are like, hey, something's up. You're not Helga. They immediately suspect her. So it almost makes the scene pointless or at least her being in the suit pointless like might as well have just had her climb up the mountain herself she's super strong anyway so it would have been like more subtle and isn't she supposed to be super smart too like yeah i mean but come on let's make up your mind here brandon and yeah. jim <laughs> like... i mean i also get wanting to be in a cool mech suit but uh, this <laughs> sure. isn't the time baby right the time. <laughs> she doesn't even need it she's basically I mean, she's basically Professor Hulk at this point. Um, right, right, yeah. exactly. So, uh, so yeah, the other guards shoot at her, and they destroy her suit. A tank fires at her, but she she rips up or she grabs one of the guards' like discarded heads, throws it at the barrel of the tank, and it plugs up the uh, the barrel. And then yeah, makes... they shouldn't have made those helmets the exact same size <laughs> yeah. of the. Uh... <laughs> of the tanks firing cylinder or whatever. Right. It's Again, you know, having that scene was more important than like, you know, a plot that makes sense, but uh whatever. So, uh and and it forces the tank to shoot a plane or something. I I wrote that. All right. Uh so now we're back with Ivana. She tells her computer geeks to uh so Lynch is coming back. Uh he's requesting um clearance to land. Ivana tells the computer geeks to just shoot down Lynch's plane. So she's a full-on bad guy at this point. I think she probably already was. And yeah. then now uh, Matt, uh, Matthew uh, slash Threshold forces Grunge to manifest his powers. And don't, don't you love how just like all the powers are just like these sort of generic X-Men powers? Mm -hmm. uh, like, all right, so we've got, uh, you know, basically She-Hulk, Fairchild. And then Grunge is basically the absorbing man, like whatever he, who isn't technically an X-Man, but um, anything he touches, he sort of absorbs the properties. And uh, mm -hmm. we're going to get uh, Roxy's, I guess, uh, telekinesis here in a minute. Um, so uh, where are we? Okay, so he gets his powers. The guards, uh, now we're back with Fairchild again. They surround her. But then uh, Grunge and Roxy show up uh, to help. Grunge absorbs uh, some nearby metal and beats the crap out of a bunch of guards. And uh, I mean, it's like, I want to say that, hey, you know, maybe the story was lacking, but at least there was like some good action scenes, but they're all played for laughs. And there's like, it just doesn't have any weight. And yeah, and, and the action scenes aren't all that great. No, anyways. no, they're not. There's they're not like well designed and the animation's kind of eh, not that great also so no yeah it's, it's not a good uh recipe here no 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 so fairchild makes a tank uh oh so that was later um all right so roxy complains about not having her superpowers then ivana 
walks out of the flames, revealing her robot arm, <laughs> which uh, I, I, I mean, I, I appreciate a good robot arm. So basically Fairchild and Ivana fight, uh, and I don't know, pretty quickly, Grunge rips off her arm, then she runs away, and they just let her run away in sort of like classic lame Saturday morning cartoon fashion. Fairchild yep. and the gang then steal a helicopter to leave, and as they are like flying away, Threshold floats up after them and explodes the pilot's head. Uh, once again, very sort of uh, Akira-esque. Um, mm -hmm. Roxy, man, like just think about how much time they spent um, animating that pilot exploding. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, they put a lot of detail into that, uh, especially when you yeah. have like weird, you know, we, I can't remember if we mentioned it here, like there's like parts where like the guards are like sort of just sort of floating there. There's a, there's a point where somebody's typing on a keyboard that isn't there. Like, do you remember that scene? No, I don't remember that at all. Oh, yeah. I was just like, wow, did you just not bother to animate a keyboard? Like, what's going on here? Yeah, uh, so then um, out of nowhere, a big surprise, Roxy gets her telekinesis powers and they uh, gently float to the ground. Meanwhile, a scientist fixes Ivana's arm, although it's not as fancy as it was before. Um, then um, now we're back with uh, Matthew and the or, Threshold and the gang, and in classic sort of supervillain fashion, he says they should join up. Of course, Fairchild says no. Threshold says his parents, and then basically he he monologues like sort of the backstory. He says that he big surprise he was the little blonde boy from the beginning. Says his parents were hunted down, and he was raised by their murderers. Then the gang fights Threshold. And uh, then Lynch and his crew slowly can they converge on the base. Um, any thoughts on any of that in there? Oh man, at this point, I just was like, <laughs> oh, we're at least getting closer to the end. I know, uh, man. I was right there with you. Uh, yeah. So Grunge and Roxy trap Threshold in a water bubble, and Fairchild then grabs him. The, the coolest of all superhero contraptions. <laughs> A, right. a fucking <laughs> water bubble straight up looks like soap and water i mean isn't uh, that what they always used to make fun of like the wonder twins like for uh combining and turning into like one of them always turns into water or something like that yeah something yeah, lame. yeah yeah well this is this is the reason why they're a team you held this is how they're able to like work together and use their powers I see, I oh see. and i forgot to mention another trope and i think you've mentioned it on like uh some of our past uh, sort of image uh, stuff, which we completely forgot to mention that this is the uh, the last episode of our journey into image comics, but we'll sum that up at the end, where the minute they get their powers, they automatically all know how to use them. Did you notice that? Yep. Oh, I yep. hate that. That's my, like- I hate that too. Yeah. So, but I mean, we already got a training montage in the beginning so I'm glad that they didn't like do something else with them learning, you know, but for the same token, it didn't make any sense. But I mean, that, that's that's a comic book trope, too, you know. Well, back in the 90s, it certainly was. Um, but uh, so, all right. So they trap him in a water bubble. Fairchild grabs him and then Lynch shows up. Uh, oh, yeah. Well, Fairchild grabs him and is like, give me one good reason why I shouldn't like twist your head off right now. Then Lynch shows up and says they're all on the same side. Lynch said he tried to save um, Matthew and Fairchild's parents, that they're actually, they're the siblings that we saw from the beginning. Um, and I wrote down, wow, what a reveal. Who couldn't see that coming? <laughs> uh, then Ivana flies away on a ship and uh, she like does the old, you know, click. And the base starts to explode, <laughs> a la Wildcats number one, almost. Uh, yeah. Then uh, Lynch and the gang all get on another ship. This is the second time they got on something to fly away from something. <laughs> Good God. Um, Fairchild tries to get Matthew slash Threshold to come with, but he won't. And uh, so, uh, so then they just basically fly away while everything explodes. And... Um, and that's that. And while they're on the ship, 
basically uh, they're all like, ooh, what do we do now? Uh, and Lynch is like, then he offers to help them, uh, you know, train them to to learn their powers, even though you know, even though they already yeah, exactly know how to use them and, and just defeated the bad guy on their first outing. Right, right, exactly. And of course, they all accept for some reason. Uh, Roxy's reluctant. She just wants a place to go and smoke because she's just she's so Gen X, dude. She's just yeah, uh, bro. She, yeah. She just wants to smoke, you know, and, and a lot of tude. She that tude. <laughs> exactly, and. Uh, uh, then the plane flies away. Uh, the end. Uh, let's go ahead and run the bumper. So, like earlier, you said like you didn't know, you didn't really understand why uh, Disney would want to make a movie of Gen Thirteen, and I mean. Definitely <laughs> watching this in 2022. I mean, that's definitely a big question. I I could see how maybe these characters were good for the time, but now it's just like lame, like relics of the 90s. What say you? Yeah, it's not good. Uh, it's very tropey. I mean, like, yeah, I don't I don't get it. Um, at, you know, any episode of the X-Men cartoon will have more character development, better animation, uh, better story. Better than the action. Worst episode, yeah, better action. The worst episode of the X-Men cartoon will be a million times better than this. I, I say obliterate this personally. <laughs> be tossed into the pit of obscurity. It's just, uh, it's not good. No, uh, no. there's uh, a... Yeah, very little redeeming value, uh, not only of the show, but uh, I mean, all right, I can see how this played as a comic. I mean, J. Scott Campbell is an amazing artist, and you know, at the time, you know, image was still pretty hot, and uh, you know, <laughs> again, they're still like floating off. Hey, our uh, our art is hot, and nobody seems to care that our writing sucks. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I mean, but you know, this, that's why people are still talking about the X-Men cartoon in 2022 favorably. And only two guys on a podcast are talking about Jid 13 <laughs> <laughs> because, yeah. you know, these characters, they're not memorable. Um, there's nothing even special about them other than the fact that I guess they looked cool at one point. But like, but if you were to just, I don't know, show a picture of Gen 13 to someone who'd never heard of him here in 2022, they would probably just say that. But then they'd be like, oh, well, well, what's their deal? And it's like, oh, well, they're kind of like Generation X, <laughs> you know, remember the Generation, mm -hmm. you know, that Generation X, but not as good. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and like, that's really all you have to say. It's like they were made by Jim Lee, you know, that guy who worked at... Um, at uh at dc for a while and um yeah just ignore that crap <laughs> who does that um but uh but yeah so uh to sum it up yeah like this uh definitely deserves to be obliterated finally we get to obliterate something image here yes. it comes the heathens have spoken you are obliterated was trash <laughs> yeah that was uh and i knew it wasn't good uh it, like i said i've watched it before i mean but, i already uh, had like sort of low expectations going in um like at first when i started watching it i was like because i i assumed it wasn't complete and when it first started i was like oh this looks like it might be something but uh but nah 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 it's uh yeah, it's pretty bad pretty bad absolutely terrible and hopefully no one will ever talk about it again we've uh done some pretty good work here you hell what do you think uh yeah this is definitely <laughs> what i wanted to wake up for with <laughs> sleep <laughs> you woke up to hang out with me buddy that's oh, why you okay. woke up yes yes uh, um but yeah it, it's it sucks that it sucks but um it sucks even more that we had to watch it Right, and, <laughs> and I really and it's almost ninety minutes long. Like, oh, it is, it's a feature length, it's a long movie. ninety minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and really, uh, I don't think had we you know reviewed just the Gen Thirteen comic that it would uh, hold up any better. 
uh, we know we might be because I mean it sounds like neither you nor I have any real nostalgia for Gen 13 no <laughs> and uh, yeah and I could say a lot of the other books that we talked about uh, they skated on a good mix of nostalgia and awesome art <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah so and I, I could say that Gen 13 has awesome art but I don't have any nostalgia for it and like many of the other books image books the writing just sucks yeah, so, and we're not covering the comic book. We're covering the cartoon. Right. Where And the animation on it is not awesome. No, no it's all, yeah, like just uh, the animation, the voice acting, like it's all very lackluster and mediocre. Yeah. And uh, it looks like a like a, it looks like a cheap 90s Saturday morning cartoon is what it looks like. Yeah. What can we compare it to? Um I know sometimes Biker Mice from Mars, something terrible, right? Oh man, I think Biker Mice from <laughs> Mars is better than this. Like at least, <laughs> like at least Biker Mice from Mars like knows what it is and is satirical. Um, where this yeah, is yeah. just like we're we're gonna be edgy, but then not have like an adult story, and then we're gonna have like lame. I mean, I would never use the term juvenile to describe humor, but that's what it is. Like it's just yeah. like the lamest of the lame, but. Uh, yeah. All right. So that concludes uh, the summer of image here on Obscurity. Now, um, if you missed our past, I don't know, seven episodes, we basically reviewed all of the uh, the main image number ones, uh, aside from like Spawn, where instead we talked about the Spawn animated series. We also talked about the Savage Dragon animated series, Wildcats number one, Cyber Force number one. Uh, even though it's not a founding like father book or whatever, we also so and it's not a book. We talked about the Max animated series as well. So if you're uh, if you've got yeah. a hard on for image content, <laughs> we've got it in spades, and, uh, baby. And I I don't think you mentioned that we covered Young Blood. Um, oh yeah, of course the, we can't forget the about person. the the book that started it all, the flip book, yep. <laughs> Rob yeah, Liefeld's yeah. Young it's Blood number episode, one. Uh, recommend that one that's a fun episode uh, oh absolutely well we, 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 i look forward to whatever it is we're covering next <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna cover rob liefeld's uh, love life next uh, i'm sure he, he would love that oh man you should god man you should see the cult that's in that uh that facebook uh, like just ev oh rob my my here's a picture of me and my friend rob like it's it's mm. funny and sad. It reminds me of working at Disney is what it does. But, uh, all right. Anything else here, man, before we sign off? Uh, no, I did leave a link in the chat to um, this movie. If you want to watch it, it is on YouTube for free because somebody uploaded it illegally. And Disney does not give a single fuck about this movie. Neither does Paramount. Uh, neither did seemingly anybody involved with its production. So... <laughs> Well, watch it if you um, want to be driven to the edge of insanity. Wow. It just boredom is what it is. Like, it wasn't even, yeah, yeah. like, there wasn't even anything to really make fun of too much in, like, sort of a fun way. It was just disappointing is what it mostly was. Uh, but, yeah. uh, oh, that's our show for today. Uh, it would be great if you subscribed and told all your friends and all that uh, lovely stuff. And uh, we'll catch you next time as we continue to discuss even more obscure media only on Obscurity Now. See you next time. Bye. You've been enjoying Obscurity Now, a podcast that's recorded live to tape and streamed to Twitch and YouTube. Subscribe so you never miss an episode or hilarious quip. Take us with you by following the download links provided in the show notes to wherever you get podcasts and take notice of our various social media links. If that's what you're into, I'm not here to judge. And make sure you join us live next week at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific as we continue to discuss more obscure media only on Obscurity, Obscurity Now. Now.